This was a, a reminder to the Jews of a principle that they well knew, or at least they should have well known, and uh, would never uh, be able to forget, really. If a sacrifice was meant to restore the man-God relationship, okay, that's why you offer sacrifice, to make yourself right with God, right? Okay? If that's what your sacrifice was meant to do, then it simply couldn't be done if a person's wrong actions toward another person damage the man-God relationship. You know, if you, uh, if you were having a feud with another person, your, your relationship with God was damaged because of that. It was an unhealed relationship. And you can't offer a sacrifice to God to be made right with God when you're wrong with other men or other people. To be effective, sacrifice really had to include confession, authentic remorse, uh, an attempt to make recompense, to make right the relationship with other people. You had to be reconciled to your neighbor. The breach between man and God could not be healed until the breach between man and man was healed. So Jesus is saying, you come to the altar before God to offer a sacrifice, you might as well just leave it there on the ground until you've gone back and made things right. That break could only be repaired by honest confession and genuine restoration. Twenty-five and twenty-six. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Uh, I tell you the truth. You will not get out of prison until you have paid the last penny. This is kind of a, what you might call practical advice. Get your trouble sorted out in time before it piles up and causes worse trouble down the road and you end up in a lawsuit. Get it straightened out before it comes to that. Practical advice. Jesus is making this point with common Jewish law. In cases of death, both the plaintiff and the defendant might never have to appear at court. And the court, because the court would use to see to it that every penny were paid to the defaulter before he could be released from prison. So if you could work this out ahead of time and not end up in court, you were better off. Again, the surface issue is that in the life, if a dispute is not quickly settled, it can go on breeding more trouble. Right? If you have a problem with somebody and you don't get it resolved now, it just eats and eats and gets worse and gets worse. Bitterness breeds bitterness to the extent it can turn into a long-lasting feud. Very start. One party is willing to admit fault. If one party is willing to apologize, if one party attempts to make restitution, the whole confrontative situation can be dispelled right there and there. So the lesson is, is that somebody should take the first step to heal the breach. As time goes by, that healing becomes more and more difficult after a certain length of time, it becomes impossible. There's so much anger and bitterness involved. On a deeper level, Jesus had something else in mind as well when he spoke with authority on this issue. With your fellow man while life lasts. And 
stand before God and the Jews held that you cannot hope to be right with God until you are right in your relationships with people. So act now to remove the barriers that anger has created. An example I can think of uh, a father and a son who have been estranged. A lot of anger, a lot of bitterness between father and son. The father is laying in his deathbed, only having weeks to go. Is the son or the father going to go ahead and end it with that bitterness still there? Or is at least one of them willing to heal the breach and make it right before the end comes to the, to the father? I think there are a lot of people who have not been willing to take that step and then regret it for the rest of their life. And the last part of that passage talking about being thrown into jail and you don't get out and you pay your debt. So how do you get get your debt paid? It's a good question, isn't it? If you're in jail and you can't work or whatever to pay off that debt. Yes, you better have some friends who are willing to put up the bucks. <laughs> I've never understood that as prison. I've never understood that concept. Well, if you may have had money in the bank, you could make arrangements to have a save and get out sure. that way. Or, you know, whatever. Well, don't you get paid something when you go work, when you crack rocks and <clears throat> when you're in prison? You get paid a stipend, right, don't you? Or maybe well, you could. Well, I don't know if in those days there was a way of earning money. In, in yeah, that's, that's I don't know. There is now. Yeah. You can make a license plate for 30 cents a day or whatever. <laughs> right. Comes out. Whatever, whatever it but is. But even in that situation, you have to have good behavior. You just can't walk in and make license plates. I mean, you've got to go through some stuff in jail for that, too. That's true. In other words, the point is you could be in jail a long time. And if you end up in jail for 10 years, that's your fault because you should have, you should have resolved this problem when you had a chance. All you had to do was swallow your pride. Apologize and get it over with. Verses 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm in trouble. <laughs> if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than to, for your whole body to go into hell. You know, this is, this is a pretty tough listening to this guy. <laughs> I, I thought I always thought that one of the worst scriptures in the Bible. I mean, it sounds so horrible. I told well, her I thought it was wrong, but there's got to be something that... that well, well, there is something. You're not supposed to take it literally. Yeah, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. You don't take it literally. First of all, here we have Jesus out of his authority, again promoting a new and higher standard. And you know, the law is very clear about adultery. In Jewish society, it's so clear that it specified that woman anyway, who was caught in the act of adultery could be stoned to death. Well, not the men had in that time. No, I was different with the men. <laughs> it's been different for the men for a long time. Jesus goes on to say that even the adulterous thought is a guilty thing in the sight of God. Now, we need to understand something, uh, something here. Uh, Jesus is not talking here of natural, normal human desires. You know, come on. You know, we've all experienced passion and desire. That's simply part of our human nature. We believe that basic emotions are not in themselves simple. Jesus is referring to the person who proactively seeks behavior that awakens passion and promotes in the end the adulterous behavior. Maybe I'm not as sinful as I thought I was. 
in our modern world, think about it. <clears throat> How many thousands of things in daily life are specifically designed to arouse, excite, and stimulate desire? I mean, you can go all over the place. <laughs> you can't turn on the TV or read the paper or look at billboards or anything else. It's all designed specifically to get you fired up. Jesus would say that the person who takes delight in the things that awaken the desire to have the forbidden things committing adulterous behavior in their fault. Verses 29 and 30.
defeat evil by trying to save your own skin. So when Jesus is speaking about plucking out your eye or cutting off your hand, he's, he's simply making a point by saying, you know, whatever it is that's causing you to be on your way to damnation, get rid of it. Cauterize it. Strike it out. Remember the famous Jimmy Carter line? He quoted that, that uh, part of the truth about uh, blessing in his heart. Yeah. It, it, it made Kevin Payne such a big um, issue because he was proclaiming that he was human. And at the same time, if you remember, he also said, I'm just like you, I, you know, I don't need to stay in some fancy place. I can, I can stay in a tent. I can stay in. Uh, if, if I went to visit somebody at home, I wouldn't expect a bed bedroom. I'd expect, you know. So he's trying to be humble and stuff. No one wanted the president of the United States to be humble. You know, particularly back then. When everything There's was a lot of people that don't like the president of the United States to quote scripture either. Yeah. That's, that's all right. Thanks, Jimmy boy, Carter knew his Bible. That's for sure. Yeah. 31-32, Jesus speaks with authority, and he says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. What is going on here? <laughs> to understand this passage and be able to digest it without getting a sour stomach <laughs> over the whole thing, we've got to be really careful. And we need to look closely at the institution of Jewish marriage. We also need to look at the institution of Greek marriage and Roman marriage. There are some very powerful subcurrents going on here when Jesus spoke these words, and we need to look at them. At the time, there was no greater danger to the marriage bond than Christianity. It was a huge threat to marriage and the family. It could easily be the reason for a breakup of a marriage, the collapse of a family, the estrangement of parents and children. Culture had a higher ideal of marriage than the Jews, believe it or not. But I'm using the word ideal. The big difference between the ideal the Jews had of marriage and the actual practice. Sounds like a lot of other people we could, we could mention. Being married was a man's sacred duty. It was an obligation. It was the only reason that any man could, the only reason that a man could not get married was if he was involved full time in the study of the law. If you weren't full time involved in the study of the law, you were expected, required, and obligated to get married. Otherwise, you would be breaking a commandment of God. Now, ideally, Jews abhorred divorce. Clear back in the prophet Malachi. It says, I hate divorce, says the Lord. But in practice, however, <laughs> while a woman could not divorce her husband under any circumstances whatsoever, including unfaithfulness, the husband could divorce his wife for any darn reason he wanted to. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy it states, a man can divorce his wife if she becomes displeasing. You want to know what displeasing means? The Jews are very good at adding to the law 
and describing what that means. They said that it meant that a man could divorce his wife if she spoiled his dinner by putting too much salt in his food. If she went out in public with her head uncovered. If she talked with men in the street. If she were a brawling woman. If she spoke disrespectfully of her husband's parents in his presence. If she was troublesome or quarrelsome. A certain rabbi, Akiva, said that the phrase, if she find no favor in his sight, meant that a man might divorce his wife if he found another woman who he considered to be more attractive than she. We're beginning to understand why Jesus is speaking here about the problem of the divorce. At the time of Jesus, divorce had become so easy that a lot of young girls refused to get married at all because it was such an insecure relationship. You know, once you were married to a guy, he divorced you. That woman was out on her own. She was in bad straight. So a lot of girl, young girls wouldn't even get married for that very reason. Jesus is here addressing a very specific societal situation where family structure was collapsing and morals were becoming more and more lax. A little bit late, but i got to finish this. In the Greek world, <laughs> in the Greek world, things were different. Sexual relationships by a man outside of marriage carried absolutely no stigma whatsoever. It was expected, even encouraged. Women were expected to live in total exclusion and be absolutely morally pure in marriage. Husbands were free to engage in as many of the as they desired, including those with temple priests and prostitutes. So the Greeks had a whole social system based on relationships outside of marriage, which could easily become the most dominant thing in a man's life, <laughs> while women were kept in forced seclusion and compulsory purity. The other factor in Greek marriage was that divorce required no legal process whatsoever. All a man had to do to dismiss his wife permanently was call in two witnesses and say, you're out of here, go away, don't come back. And that was it. Now, in the Roman world, marriage and the home had originally been sacred. Marriage was described as a lifelong relationship. All of Roman religion, Roman society, all of Roman legality was based upon the home, the unit of the family and the home. You want to know something? This is a fact, apparently. During the first 500 years of Roman rule, there is not one single solitary recorded case of divorce. 500 years. But, but, then the influence of the Greeks started to creep into the Romans. They infiltrated and took over Roman society, and the result was catastrophic. Divorce became so common that women identified the years by the names of their various husbands. Marriage became nothing but an unfortunate necessity in the Roman world, it was even true that there were only, you know, it was said that there were only two happy days in a married man's life. The first day he clasped his wife to his breast, and the day he laid her in her grave. <laughs> so, to finish up with today, let me reread verses 31 and 32. You have a better idea of what Jesus is talking about. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for matter of faithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. 
against the background of those three societies. Jesus is attacking immoral, unfaithful behavior. Okay? It's, it's not like he's attacking divorce so much as he's attacking everything behind it. I'm through. Well, that's the thing, though, that comes in the 